extremely happy to have Dr. Rob McBain come back with us this year. And we're going to go over his pretest questions while he's making his way to the podium. But he's going to focus with us today on, uh, on the Venus side of the system. So his first question here today is a 32-year-old woman with a two-day history of painful right leg swelling. Two weeks ago, she drove to Chicago for a concert, super spreader event. Uh, it was a five-hour drive, no stops. She does not use birth control. On exam, there is mild right ankle edema. What is the next best step in her management? Is it a fibrin D-dimer, a duplex ultrasound, a CT venogram, low molecular weight heparin now, and then send for prompt imaging, or a Pixaban 10 milligrams now, then send for imaging? What is your best option for treating her? Okay, divergence of opinions amongst the audience. This question continues. The ultrasound imaging revealed a right distal femoral and popliteal DVT. The CBC and creatinine are normal. She is initiated on a Pixaban, 10 milligrams twice daily for a week and then five milligrams twice daily. After six months, she returns for further counseling. She has done well on a Pixaban without complications. What would you recommend? We should stop the apixaban and start her on low-dose aspirin. We should stop the apixaban and check a D-dimer. We should stop the apixaban and repeat the ultrasound for residual thrombus. We should stop the apixaban and obtain thrombophilia test panel. Or continue apixaban at a lower dose, 2.5 milligrams twice daily. What's the best option there? All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The next question is a 60-year-old woman, <clears throat> two-day history of progressive dyspnea and cough. On examination, she appears well, but is mildly tachypnic. Her blood pressure is 100. Her pulse rate is 92. Her O2 sat is 96% on room air. She has a subtle peristernal lift and left leg edema. Her troponin is elevated. Her NT pro BNP is elevated. She has a CTA and a duplex ultrasound report. They look like this. What would you do next? Systemic thrombolytic therapy, catheter-directed thrombolytic therapy, surgical thrombectomy, admit for IV heparin, or start outpatient DOAC therapy. Okay. So Rob, you have an opportunity to improve our knowledge about thromboembolism and other venous diseases. Thank you so much for being here again this year. Thanks, Steve. It's sure a uh, pleasure to be here. And um, I want to just uh, thank uh, the audience for their next 40 minutes of their life to spend some time with me talking about venous and lymphatic diseases. My disclosure is that I uh, do have a clinical trial uh, which is funded by Bristol Myers Squibb. So, for the next uh, for the 35 minutes or so, we're going to recognize a diagnosed deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism using an appropriate diagnostic algorithm. We're going to design a management plan for stable patients who have DVT or PE, including the direct, uh, correct uh, time to therapy. We're going to design a management plan for patients who are unstable including the use of IVC filters and thrombolytic therapy. We're gonna talk briefly about antiphospholipid syndrome, and then in the last few minutes, we're gonna talk about the evaluation and management of patients with lymphedema. So let's start with our first learning objective. Whenever you see a patient in clinical practice, or if you see the stem on the board, and it is asking you about DVT evaluation, the first thing that they want you to do 
is to assess the pretest clinical pro probability of disease. And what they want you to do is to use the Wells criteria. And uh, based on the scoring system, you'll determine that that patient has a pretest probability of disease, which is either high, moderate, or low. And of course, you'll look at this list and you'll be dismayed that you won't be able to remember this on the test. But what I really want you to remember is that if you look at the stem, ask yourself, does this patient clearly have a DVT? Or is it more, gee, maybe, or I don't think that they have a DVT. You won't be able to memorize this uh, list. I wouldn't want you to, but use your good clinical skills and ask that question. For sure they have a DVT, uh, maybe they do, or I don't think that they do. And you'll go through the risk in the exam and an alternative diagnosis. And if the patient's evaluation, if your clinical assessment of this individual on the on the stem is that they have a low to moderate pretest probability of disease, we are looking for a very sensitive test to exclude the disease because their propensity or their um, likelihood of having a DVT is actually fairly low. However, if they have a high pretest probability disease, now we're looking for a very specific test because their likelihood is about 50%. And this is where the blood test Fibrin D-dimer comes into our diagnostic strategy. So again, if you are reading through the stem and you say, gee, it's, it could have a, this individual could have a DVT or it's unlikely, then a D-dimer would be very useful because again, we're looking for a very sensitive test and these have a very high negative predictive value of 99% or thereabouts. For the individual who has a high pretest probability disease, it's not specific, but very useful for excluding the disease in patients in the appropriate setting. A positive test is not useful because of the many, many reasons that test could be positive, but a negative test is very helpful in excluding the diagnosis. So you do your clinical pretest probability of disease, uh, you determine whether they have high, intermediate, or low pretest probability of disease, and then you do uh, your appropriate testing. If it's low to moderate pretest probability disease and you do a D-dimer and it's negative, you're done. You do not need to do any additional testing. However, if it is positive or if there's a high pretest probability disease, of course, then we're going to turn to imaging. The imaging that we're going to turn to is duplex ultrasound imaging. Why? Because it's quick, it's cheap, it doesn't have any ionizing radiation and has no contrast. So here is a normal, uh, a popliteal vein and uh, just a couple of features. First of all, when you look at the images, the gain should be set really low. The lumen should be widely patent with a monochromatic color as we turn on the color Doppler. But the way that we interpret this test is not by color, but rather by compression. So here you can see that the popliteal vein, once compressed, is completely compressible, consistent with a normal or negative duplex ultrasound. Contrast that to this individual who has an acute DVT, and you can see that this vein is distended. Here's the femoral vein, common femoral vein here, the, uh, the uh, profunda femoral vein. It's filled with hypoechoic material. It's non-compressible, consistent with the diagnosis of acute deep vein thrombosis. What if they show you this image? This is an individual who's had a prior DVT, but now has chronic post-thrombotic scarring. And so this individual has thin lumen, thickened walls, and when you go to compress this vein, it doesn't completely compress. Here's another example. Notice the internal echoes here of this individual who's had a prior popliteal deep vein thrombosis. This is consistent with post-thrombotic changes. This is not an acute DVT. And you would ask yourself, if the boards ask you, do you want to start anticoagulation for this individual? The answer, of course, is no, because there's no embolic potential for this. Here is a patient who was taken to the operating room. Uh, the uh, femoral vein was uh, incised, and you can see the scar tissue, the uh, fibrotic thickening, the internal webs, there is no way that this is going to embolize. This is a chronic scar, not an acute or subacute thrombus.
If you don't know for sure, a fibrin D-dimer can be helpful, and that will, of course, be normal because there's no active thrombus occurring in this scenario. If they give you the option of going straight to CT venography or MR venography, they have to give you additional information. And the additional information that you'd be looking for is a, perhaps a patient who may have an iliocaval DVT, but maybe not a distal DVT or, or, a, or a popliteal femoral DVT. So if they give you this option, but the, the, the scenario doesn't speak to an iliocaval DVT, the answer is that you would choose not to do this type of imaging and prefer to do a duplex ultrasound. We are doing more and more venograms these days. This is an individual who has uh, been placed in the prone position. We've accessed the femoral vein through the popliteal vein. And here you can see a very nice normal segment of venous physiology, uh, this femoral vein. But once we get up into the pelvis, this is not normal. In fact, this, of course, is an acute DVT. You can see an abrupt cutoff. If you can continue to image, you can see that there's some filling but definitely a filling defect here. This is consistent with an acute iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis in this individual. What about for pulmonary embolism? The same scenario. You assess the pretest probability of disease using Wells criteria and ask yourself, for sure I think this patient has a pulmonary embolism versus uh, could be, or for sure this patient doesn't have a pulmonary embolism. And what I want you to do is the same strategy as you did for deep vein thrombosis using the D-dimer and then imaging when appropriate. The only distinction between pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis is that if you have a high clinical suspicion for a pulmonary embolism and they give you the option of treating and then sending for imaging, that would be very reasonable and appropriate. Why? Because of the high mortality rate associated with this disease entity. The imaging that you're going to send patients for is, of course, CT angiography. And the only caveat here is to read the stem carefully. If they tell you about renal impairment, they're asking you to assess the possibility of contrast-induced nephropathy because a CT angiogram comes at the expense of about 100 cc's of contrast. But when they show you the imaging, as we did with our first case, you should look carefully for contrast-enhanced structures and then look for filling defects, such as in these three individuals, a small pulmonary embolism on the left, two moderate-sized pulmonary embolism for the central case, and then this patient with a large saddle pulmonary embolism on the right. So the learning objectives and summary points for my first part of this lecture, use your clinical assessment. That's very, very powerful. And that's going to help you with your diagnostic strategy. Don't immediately jump to imaging for the reasons that we've discussed. If you have high probability of disease, particularly for a pulmonary embolism, if they give you the option of choosing anticoagulation and then sending for uh, imaging, that would be very appropriate because the risk of uh, uh, anticoagulating that patient abruptly is going to be low from a bleeding perspective. But recall that the thrombotic, the death mortality signal uh, with, this in the, uh, with this disease can be, can be quite substantial. Don't be fooled by chronic post-thrombotic changes as I showed you. This is not an indication for acute anticoagulation. So next, let's talk about our patient who has stable venous thromboembolism, and let's talk about the treatment to start and the duration of therapy. Heparin, of course, is a very reasonable uh, drug to start for the patient with an acute deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. Uh, the guidelines would prefer that we choose low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin for the reasons that the risk of bleeding with this medication would be lower. Remember that if you do choose unfractionated heparin, part of your management strategy has to be for platelet count monitoring. So the guidelines, because of the risk of, of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, because the risk of HIT is as high as 5%, you need to remember to monitor the platelet count. And for board-taking purposes, if they show you two serial platelet counts, 0.5, 
and the platelet count drops substantially in a patient who's receiving heparin, you have to be thinking about the clinical entity of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So if they show you two platelet counts, be thinking they must be asking me about HIT. Look for a history in the stem of a prior exposure or a duration of anticoagulation, which should be at least five days. Look for the patient who's taking heparin, a good heparin dose, and yet they're still clotting. That would be an indication for thinking about the diagnosis of HIT. If they do give you a scenario of HIT, you need to be thinking to stop all heparin exposure. You would never convert this patient from unfractionated heparin to low molecular weight heparin because of the crossover with these drugs. Remember to do your 4T calculation and then to obtain appropriate testing, which would be the platelet factor for ELISA. Start a direct thrombin inhibitor. If they give you a patient who has renal impairment, remember that you can use our Gatraban. That would be very reasonable because it's cleared by the liver. If they show you a patient who has cirrhosis with HIT, be thinking that you'd have to choose an alternative management strategy because of this problem. And bivalerudin would be a very nice option for that individual. And then once you get the platelet count recovered, transition that individual to a warfarin or a direct oral anticoagulant, irrespective of whether they have an acute thrombotic event. Next, we're going to talk about the direct oral anticoagulants. And for our purposes here today, we're talking about the 10 inhibitors, apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, or the thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran. There have been a number of acute treatment trials with using each of these medications, and you should know that these, uh, in fact, were all uh, very successfully completed. Apixaban, uh, compared to low molecular weight heparin warfarin, had similar efficacy but superior safety. And then rivaroxaban, edoxaban, dabigatran, all similar efficacy and safety to the traditional low molecular weight heparin and warfarin. But recall, recall that if they give you the option of dabigatran or edoxaban, you have to provide five days of parenteral pretreatment before starting those medications. And so it's not like warfarin where you overlap the two drugs for five days. You simply give the parenteral therapy for five days, stop the parenteral therapy, and then start either dabigatran or edoxaban. Next, I want to briefly talk about treatment duration. From the standpoint of the guidelines, remember that the treatment duration for acute DVT or PE is three months. Everything afterwards is secondary prevention. Patients who get secondary prevention are those who have an unprovoked event. So if there's an unprovoked event, the second thing you want to ask is what is their bleeding risk? And uh, if their bleeding risk is reasonable, those individuals who have an unprovoked event would be good candidates for secondary prevention. Then once you establish secondary prevention, of course, we want to see these patients annually to make sure that their bleeding risk still makes sense from a therapeutic perspective. There have been a number of secondary prevention trials using the direct oral anticoagulants. And in general, these drugs are superior to placebo. And that would be, a, I mean, that would be a, a really a no brainer because of course they're better than placebo to prevent recurrent venous thromboembolism. The remedy trial, dabigatran versus warfarin, there was no difference. But the real home run for secondary prevention with the direct oral anticoagulants is the very, very low bleeding rate for each of these medications. And you can see that these bleeding rates are, are almost, almost 0%, regardless of which uh, agent you choose. So to put that all into perspective then, if you have a patient who's had an unprovoked event, They've completed three to six months of anticoagulation. You need to have a discussion with that individual balancing the risks of recurrence versus the risks of bleeding. And so for these individuals, if they've completed three to six months of anticoagulation and you stop, their annual risk of recurrence is going to be 10%. If you choose to stop an anticoagulant and simply use a baby aspirin, you can improve that rate to 6.6%. But if you choose an uh, active anticoagulant, either warfarin or one of the direct oral anticoagulants, you can greatly reduce that risk of recurrent thrombosis. But you have to counterbalance that against the bleeding risk. So for individuals who are not receiving any anticoagulant living in the community, their risk of major bleeding, 
is going to be one in a thousand per year. Aspirin increases that risk to about a half a percent. And notice that the direct oral anticoagulants have no greater risk of bleeding than aspirin. And warfarin, of course, a slightly increased risk compared to direct oral anticoagulants. When thinking about the acute treatment of venous thromboembolism, we always think about should we use a, uh, a compression stocking. So if the guidelines ask you to use compression stockings to reduce the risk of the post-thrombotic syndrome, based on recent data, you would say no, you would not choose that option. So the summary points for learning objective two, for the initial treatment, there are many, many drug options. And we need to look further into the stem to decide which drug option would be best for the patient that they present to us. For the initial treatment, remember that apixaban was superior to low molecular weight heparin warfarin, and I think many additional meta-analyses have shown that advantage. For provoked events, three to six months would be all that we would treat that individual for and then stop. For unprovoked events, we would consider continuing therapy for secondary prevention if that individual has a low to moderate risk of bleeding. Remember, our treatment decisions always have to be bleeding versus recurrent thrombosis, and that has to be part of that decision making. All right, next we're gonna to turn to our third objective, which is the management of the unstable patient. And remember, this stratification begins at the initial clinical encounter. It's very simple. Is the patient unstable, meaning do they have shock, or are they stable? This is a very simple early decision to make, and you can make this by carefully reading through the stem on these questions. So when you see these patients, if they have a pulmonary embolism, you need to determine, are they stable or unstable? For the purposes of the guidelines and for the purposes of the boards, un unstable patients or patients with shock due to pulmonary embolism has a very specific definition. For these individuals, we would consider thrombolytic therapy. If we're gonna do thrombolytic therapy, remember to read through the stem carefully and make sure that there's no major contraindication for that individual. If they have a major contraindication and they offer you either surgery or catheter-directed therapy, that would be a better choice. So for unstable patients, patients who have shock secondary to pulmonary embolism, the number needed to treat is only 10 to prevent really important outcomes. Reduction of death, reduction of recurrent pulmonary embolism, this is a good treatment for those individuals who don't have a contraindication. But if the patient is stable, then there really is no advantage to giving thrombolytic therapy for that individual. And this is in keeping with the guidelines. So for stable patients, we would not recommend thrombolytic therapy. If they're unstable, if in the stem they tell you that this patient has shock, then that would be a very reasonable uh, indication for lytic therapy if there's no major contraindications. And read through that stem carefully in order to determine that. The guidelines for the ideal patient, the guidelines would prefer systemic delivery over over catheter directed. Remember the contraindications and what we're really talking about is brain pathology. Is there any brain pathology, trauma to the brain, history of intracranial hemorrhage, malignancy with metastasis to the brain? These would be indications that you would say, no, we're not gonna give thrombolytic therapy to that patient. Remember, if they're actively bleeding, we would not give lytic therapy to that individual. If they show you a patient who has a high bleeding risk or a patient who's unstable despite thrombolysis, this would be a good indication to refer that individual for catheter-directed therapy. Likewise, if the patient has a contraindication to thrombolytic therapy or maybe failed thrombolysis and they offer you surgical embolectomy, that would be a very reasonable strategy. But what if your patient is stable I showed you this in one of the pretest questions. What if they're stable and yet they have evidence of RV dysfunction? What we're talking about here is the patient who has a submassive pulmonary embolism. So remember, massive pulmonary embolism, this is gonna be one in 20 patients. They have signs of shock. For patients who are clinically stable but have evidence of RV dysfunction, either by CT or echo or exam, or if they have evidence of RV injury, such as troponin, 
then these individuals would carry the diagnosis of submassive pulmonary embolism. Read the stem carefully. Look at the physical findings. Do they give you a patient with an elevated JVP? Maybe there's a right-sided lift with a positive S3 that, that's there only with inspiration. Maybe there's a prominent P2. If they give you this EKG, this is a very helpful EKG when the findings are there. If it's not there, it's not that helpful because of the specificity, but notice the Q, or sorry, S1, Q3, T3 findings here. Again, very useful, but uh, rarely uh, evident uh, by, uh, by EKG. If they show you a CT scan and they show you images through the heart, be thinking that what they're asking you is, is there evidence of RV dysfunction? And so endocardium to endocardium, right ventricle over left ventricle, this ratio should be 0.9 or less. If it's greater, as in this indication here, you can see that this patient has right ventricular dysfunction. So the question then is, who should get thrombolytic therapy if they have a submassive pulmonary embolism? I think this, answer, this question was answered nicely by the PITHO trial, which was published a few years ago. 1,000 patients randomized to tenecteplase or heparin if they had findings of submassive pulmonary embolism, while the combined outcomes of death and hemodynamic collapse reach statistical significance. What we're really asking for is death. And of course, that wasn't statistically different between the two treatment arms. But major bleeding, five times greater in the lytic arm. Intracranial hemorrhage, 10 times greater in the lytic arm. And when we look at the follow-up, the seven-year follow-up from the PITHO trial, you can see that there's no advantage for giving thrombolytics for patients who have a submassive pulmonary embolism. And notice that pulmonary hypertension, the thing that we don't want to happen, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, very, very infrequent in both treatment arms and not different between the two treatment arms. What about IVC filter placement? This is very easy. You read through the stem and you ask yourself, is there a major contraindication to anticoagulation therapy? If the answer is there's no contraindication, then you would not place an IVC filter. But let's say you read through the stem and the patients had, had maybe neurosurgery yesterday, or maybe they're actively bleeding. Some patient that you literally cannot anticoagulate, if they give you the option of a retrievable IVC filter, that would be reasonable. So the summary points for learning objective three, uh, remember that for patients who are stable, clinically stable, thrombolysis offers very little, if any, uh, survival advantage, and so we would not choose that. The risk of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is low and does not seem to improve for those patients with submassive pulmonary embolism who are treated aggressively with lytic therapy, and the benefits seem to be offset by major bleeding for these individuals. But if you have a patient who's unstable, who shows signs of shock, and they've got a large pulmonary embolism, and they have no contraindications, then thrombolytic therapy is very reasonable. All right, so let's move on to our fourth learning objective. This is related to the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is a question, we won't use our audience response, but this is a question for you to consider. 34-year-old female with acute left leg DVT seen in the emergency room, thrombophilia testing drawn prior to anticoagulation delivery, uh, and then the patient sent home on a rivaroxaban. Now her PCP calls you and asks what should they do because the test results are back and she has a lupus anticoagulant. What are your treatment recommendations for this individual who's now on rivaroxaban? Should we continue riva? Should we uh, continue riva but add aspirin? Should we stop riva and change to a pixaban? Should we continue RIVA and repeat our lupus anticoagulant testing in three months? Or do we need to stop RIVA and begin enoxaparin and warfarin? So I'll let you think of that just for a second. What would you do? This is a common scenario in our practice, and I'm sure in yours. When thinking about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and if they show you these patients in a stem, you need to look both for clinical events and laboratory testing. So to meet the criteria for APS, you need to have a clinical event. 
That might be a venous thrombotic event, most commonly an arterial event. Maybe they have thrombocytopenia with fetal loss. Maybe a young woman who has repeated fetal loss. Maybe there's valve dysfunction or skin ulceration. You need a clinical event. You, it's not enough just to have a laboratory test. You need to have a clinical event to make this diagnosis. And then on the laboratory side, it's both ELISA-based testing for the antibodies, both anti-cardiolipin and beta-2 glycoprotein 1. And as well, we want to look for the clot-based testing, which is the lupus anticoagulant. In order to have a definite diagnosis of APS, you need to have both a clinical event and a laboratory test marker. Once you've made the diagnosis, you have to confirm the diagnosis with repeat testing in three months. If they show you a patient on the boards and the testing has been done while the individual is receiving anticoagulant therapy, you should be suspect that the anticoagulation therapy is giving you a false positive test result. And this is particularly true if the individual is taking a direct thrombin inhibitor such as dabigatran. If they give you a patient on the boards and they get, tell you that this individual has a prolonged APTT at baseline and this individual is now being treated with heparin, you cannot use the APTT platform in order to monitor the heparin. What if they have the, the horrible combination of HIT and APS? You cannot use the APTT to monitor that individual. Remember, a prolonged APTT is not useful for monitoring and we cannot use that strategy. For 5% of patients who have APS and have a lupus anticoagulant, their baseline prothrombin time will also be inhibited. If that's the case, you cannot use the INR to monitor warfarin therapy for this individual. You have to use 10A activity. And we would use the 10A activity. We would reduce that. We would continue that warfarin, reduce the 10A activity until it gets to the therapeutic range of 25 to 35%. Now, for 95% of patients who have APS, their prothrombin time at baseline will not be inhibited. And for these individuals, we want to use the INR to monitor. We want to target an INR of 2.0 to 3.0. But if they give you the option of using a direct oral anticoagulant and the patient clearly has APS, we would not choose that option for two reasons, or at least for the reason of two major trials which have been published. The TRAPS trial, this was a a, a trial of direct oral anticoagulants versus warfarin in patients who were triple positive. Triple positive, what does that mean? It means that they had lupus anticoagulant plus antiphospholipid plus beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies that were all positive. In this trial, patients were randomized to either rivaroxaban or warfarin. The trial was stopped early because of the excess events in the rivaroxaban arm. And notice that the events were not venous events, they were primarily arterial events, and so we do not want to use uh, a direct oral anticoagulant in a patient who's triple positive. Then along came the Spanish trial. The difference between the TRAPS trial and the Spanish trial is that to get into the, the Spanish trial, you only needed one assay to be positive, so lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipin or and a beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody positivity. Same trial design, but again, notice that there were excess events in those individuals who were randomized to rivaroxaban. And when you look at the appendix of this trial, all of these events occurred in those individuals who had a lupus anticoagulant. And so specifically, if patients have a lupus anticoagulant, we would not use a rivaroxaban or any of the direct oral anticoagulants for their management. All right, so getting back to this individual, they're on rivaroxaban, they now have a lupus anticoagulant, what are we gonna do? We have to stop the rivaroxaban and switch them to low molecular weight heparin plus, in, uh, plus warfarin, get them therapeutically anticoagulated, stop the enoxaparin because of the reasons I've just discussed. So for learning objective number four, for anti patients who in the stem, you're wondering if they have antiphospholipid syndrome, look for prolonged baseline clotting measures such as the APTT or the ProTime. Look for clinical events, arterial or venous thrombosis. Maybe they have valve disease with thickening of their valve, miscarriage. These are patients who we should be thinking about antiphospholipid syndrome. 
Remember that if the APTT is prolonged at baseline, we cannot use that for monitoring any parenteral therapy. If you have a patient who has positive test results, you need to repeat those tests in three months for confirmation. And then, especially for the individual who has APS with a lupus anticoagulant, we want to be thinking about warfarin and not a direct oral anticoagulant. For our last learning objective, I want you to think about atypical venous thrombotic events, including uh, we're going to talk briefly about varicose veins, and we're going to talk about lymphedema. So quickly through one slide on varicose veins. This is very, very common. These are affecting up to 30% of the population. This is predominantly an inherited predisposition for these ropey, uh, valvular incompetent varicose veins. It's primarily a valvular abnormality. Treatment is conservative. Remember that patients will have neither life nor limb threatening events with these uh, varicose veins. Next, what about the atypical thrombotic uh, events? These are patients who've had a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Maybe they've had a Bud Chiari with hepatic vein thrombosis, portal vein thrombosis, splenic vein thrombosis, or renal vein thrombosis. This is very, very simple. Whenever you see a patient who's had an atypical venous thrombotic event, you need to ask what is wrong with the organ that is supplied by that vein. So for example, if it's, uh, if it's cerebral venous thrombosis, is there any brain cancer? Have they had trauma, infection, surgery? In fact, cancer for each of these indications is something that we absolutely need to exclude. With regards to treatment, it's very, very simple. We, do, we treat these individuals the same as we would treat a patient with a conventional DVT or pulmonary embolism. Look for provoked versus unprovoked, and that'll help you to determine who gets secondary prevention. Lastly, just a couple of slides on lymphedema. Why talk about lymphedema? Because it's super common. In the United States, it's primarily patients who've had cancer and cancer-related uh, events or surgeries. Worldwide, it would be filarial complications. Secondly, you want to know about lymphedema because swelling is super common. You'll have lots of lectures this week about heart failure, but there are many different kinds and causes of swelling, including medications. When seeing a patient with lymphedema on the boards, you have to ask in the stem, is this painless and non-dependent? What does that mean? It means that when the patient goes to bed at night and wakes up the next morning, the swelling is just as bad as it was the night before. And then the, the texture of the skin will be a waxy texture. We call it the po d'orange or skin of the orange findings. For patients who, again, we've talked briefly about the causative nature of this disease in the United States, it's cancer and cancer-related therapies. Worldwide, it's filarial in infections. When considering the examination and the evaluation for these patients, rely on your physical findings. And then a lymphocentogram, as you can see here, is the test of choice. If they offer you a lymphangiogram, the answer is no, you would not choose a lymphangiogram. And here's a normal lymphocentogram. Again, here's a lymphocentogram with clear dermal pattern. Treatment includes compression. It includes manual lymphatic drainage, which might, they might give you the option of massage or intermittent pneumatic compression pumping. So for patients uh, related to this fifth objective, remember that atypical deep vein thrombosis should raise concerns regarding organ pathology of the venous drainage. Lymphedema is diagnosed clinically and confirmed by lymphocentigraphy, not lymphangiogram, and then the management is multidisciplinary. So some final thoughts on venous thrombosis. Remember that your clinical assessment is powerful. Use that pretest probability disease to determine how you're going to evaluate that patient. There are a number of different uh, treatments in our, in our toolbox now. Look for other factors in the stem. Distinguish provoked from unprovoked when thinking about secondary thrombotic management. And for patients who have massive pulmonary embolism, consider lytic therapy. Remember the contraindications. For patients who have submassive, 
These are patients who are clinically stable, treat conservatively without the use of thrombolysis. So with that then, Steve, I will stop. Over and uh, join me here in the Q&A grotto. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we'll go through your questions here and uh, one or two that came in uh, on the portal while you were speaking. So this is that initial question of a 32-year-old woman with a two-day history of painful swollen uh, right leg. Two weeks ago, she drove to Chicago for a concert. It's a five-hour drive. She didn't stop. She does not use birth control. On exam, there is mild right ankle edema. What is the best step in her management? Is it get a D-dimer? get an ultrasound, get a CT venogram, start her on heparin and then send for imaging, or start her on a Pixaban and then send for imaging? Okay, so everybody liked uh, uh, duplex ultrasound imaging. I chose fibrin D-dimer here because uh, really what all we have in this stem is um, you, you have this travel, which honestly is not a very long travel. You've got a little bit of swelling. And if you were to do your Wells criteria for this individual, I think you would come up with moderate pretest probability of disease. And so, that, uh, and so you might argue that, no, I think there's this high pretest probability disease. I might throw in another variable. The point is that you want to use this pretest probability disease assessment in order to stratify your patient to a very simple, very quick D-dimer or... Uh, more, um, uh, more, con more uh, uh, imaging. If the chances are slim, D-dimer. Yes, yes. If the chances are high, image the guy. Yeah, Someone taught me that. I one. love that. I love that. Yeah, that's back in mind. All right. Now, for some reason, uh, they must not have called you first for yeah. this one because an ultrasound they was obtained, or the, the D-dimer right. was positive, there and so therefore, in the algorithm, an ultrasound was obtained. Yep. And it did reveal a distal, femoral, and popliteal DBT. CBC and creatinine are normal. She started on a Pixaban uh, with a plan for 10 milligrams twice a day for a week and then uh, going down to 5 milligrams twice a day. She comes back to see you after her six months of initial therapy for further counseling. She's done well with no complications. What would you recommend? Stop the Apixaban and start her on aspirin. Stop the Apixaban and check her D-dimer. Stop the apixaban and repeat her ultrasound to look for residual thrombus. Stop the apixaban and obtain a thrombophilia test panel. Or continue the apixaban but reduce the dose to 2.5 milligrams twice a day. All right, so, so prior to 2016, we would have done a lot of these things. We would have checked a D-dimer. Uh, we would have looked for residual thrombus. We would have done thrombophilia testing. The point of this question is that this particular individual has had no risk, meaning she's had a very short five-hour drive to Chicago, and uh, that's not enough of a travel exposure to put this individual at risk. The point is, is this individual has an unprovoked event. And so the guidelines now would say D-dimer, uh, residual ultrasound for thr uh, thrombus, uh, thrombophilia testing, none of these have a role in that particular patient's evaluation. And regardless of what those show, this is an individual who we would consider for secondary prevention. And you look through the stem and she's not had any problems with the pig span. There's no bleeding concern here. This is an individual who you would talk about long-term secondary prevention. And the fact that it's distal, femoral, and popliteal, that, that goes into that uh, higher desire to, uh, for secondary prevention. Yes, and yep. so, uh, so the guidelines also distinguish between a proximal DVT versus a distal DVT. A distal DVT is a DVT that is involving the calf veins. So posterior tibial, uh, perineal, soleal, gastrocnemius. These individuals have a distal DVT. But if there's a DVT that involves the popliteal, femoral, a uh, common femoral iliac system. This is a proximal DVT, and for these individuals, uh, we would consider secondary prevention. So, uh, so the, the, the fact that it's just in the popliteal, maybe the distal femoral, still makes it a proximal DVT. Yeah. 
So that's how we would manage this individual. Yeah, I, I think this is clearly a really important point just based on the voting we've seen here and probably the number of curbside consults you get about yeah. how long do you continue therapy. Well, yeah. you know, because we, we all see the patients in the hospital and we start them on their initial therapy and say, see them in three months, but yep. that's then we forget that there's the next phase. And for yep. someone like this, it might be indefinite therapy. Absolutely. And recall too, so um, many people liked uh, thrombophilia testing. Even for an unprovoked event, an atypical event, a, a, a idiopathic event, your test results are gonna be positive only 25% of the time. So 75% of the people that you see with an unprovoked event are gonna have normal thrombophilia test panel that doesn't get you off the hook. All it means is that we need to work harder and try and find more variables that we should put into our toolbox. Uh, so a negative, a negative thrombophilia test doesn't help you. A positive thrombophilia test doesn't help you either because you're going to consider long-term therapy anyway. And then uh, part of it's here in this, in this text, but you, you said during the lecture that when you go to secondary prevention, you're going to want to reassess that patient annually. And what you're reassessing for was bleeding complications right. and bleeding risk. Absolutely. Yep. 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 And, and also, well, also you're going to want to assess compliance right. uh, because in this day and age, um, half of the patients that we start on an anticoagulant will stop it uh, irregardless of our recommendations. So yep. I think it's just helpful to have this. Yep. Uh, this con uh, consultation again uh, to revisit uh, in a year. And I, and I wasn't sure, so when you reduce the dose to two and a half milligrams here, what's the, what's the recurrence rate in secondary prevention mode? Yeah, it's going to be like 1%, 1%. 1 and a half percent. Okay. And, and the, the reason to reduce the dose is the Amplify Extend trial. And the idea is that you'll be even further reducing the bleeding signal. But honestly, the bleeding signal will be low for both individuals, yep. both 5 and 2.5. But the FDA label now for secondary prevention is a Pixaban 2.5. Fantastic. All right. Next case is a 60-year-old woman with a two-day history of progressive shortness of breath and cough. On exam, she appears well, but is tachypnic. Her blood pressure is 100 over 76. Her pulse rate is 92. Her oxygen stats are 96. She has a subtle peristernal lift and left leg edema. Her troponin is elevated. Her <coughs> NT-proBNP is elevated. She has a CTA that looks like the left image and a duplex ultrasound report that is the right image. So soak that in for all it's worth. And then we're going to ask about the, the best therapy for this patient. So should we start systemic lytic? Should we do catheter-based lytic? Should we do surgical thrombectomy? Should we admit for IV heparin? or start outpatient DOAC therapy? Wonderful. Excellent. Uh, yeah, that's really great. So you all recognize that this is a submassive pulmonary embolism. And so because it's submassive based on the PITHO trial, I just cannot recommend lytic therapy for this individual. And there's no reason to send them for either catheter-directed or surgery. She's not unstable. And then would you ever treat as an outpatient? No, she's got submassive pulmonary embolism. She deserves 24 hours at least of observation and then transition to oral therapy. Fantastic. Is there, is there any... Is there any role for catheter-based mechanical uh, thrombectomy in, in a subset of patients? Uh, so, I, so the way we would do it here, and uh, the, the way the guidelines would recommend, is that you admit the patient to the hospital. You give them 24 hours of anticoagulation therapy while monitoring them. The vast majority are going to improve and going to be quite uh, clinically better, quite a bit uh, better the next day. But there is a small subset of patients who won't. And for those individuals who the following day they're still not doing well, maybe they're worse, maybe they're a bit unstable, that would be the individual who you might consider uh, uh, sending for either systemic thrombolytics or catheter-directed, I think is a very, a very reasonable option for that particular individual. And again, that's the reason for admitting the patient. You watch them, make sure that they get better. They're all going to, except for a very tiny subset. All right, and so uh, here's, here's the guideline statement that uh, largely informed Rob's lecture. But one thing I want, that you always get questions afterwards, I, I know. And, and, and you mentioned compressive uh, stockings for, yep. for varicose veins. But when do you 
which patients are eligible for? Are there any guidelines yeah. that direct the, the, the other therapies for yeah. varicose veins? So, the, so the, 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 the requirement is that you have to start with uh, compression first and give individuals uh, several weeks of, of compression therapy first. And they have to fail. Of course, nobody wants to use compression therapy, partic <laughs> even in Rochester, where you know half the year it's a it's a wonderful snowy weather. Uh, nobody wants to wear compression stockings, but the guidelines re require us to use compression first. The patient fails, and then they would go to the next step. The next step would be either catheter uh, directed therapy or sclerotherapy. Right. And very very few patients get surgical stripping anymore. 